uh, we are we are uh, in our first lesson on, on in the study of Joseph pursuing God's dream. Uh, we're going to be looking. Uh, we're going to be uh, go, uh, starting at Genesis the thirty seventh chapter, and, and so we're going to be uh, uh, the, the launching of basically the story of Joseph really starts here uh, in Genesis the the thirty seventh chapter. Uh, uh, there, there's a there's a great study if you want to if you want to see the, uh, the there's a great study uh, that that you can uh, do uh, in starting cha chapters earlier and see Joseph's connection to uh, what they considered to be the seed of of Abraham and how and the role that he plays there is a, a powerful study but we're gonna we're gonna launch, we're gonna launch uh, where Joseph start because this is a study of course about Joseph notice what it said in verse number one. Now Jacob dwelt in the land where his father was a stranger, in the land of Canaan. This is the history of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brothers. And the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to his father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age. Also, he had made him a tunic of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. Now Joseph had a dream, and he told it to his brothers, and they hated him even more. So he said to them, Please hear this dream which I had dreamed. There we were, binding sheaves in the field, then behold, my sheep arose and also stood upright, and indeed your sheep stood all around and bowed down to my sheep. And his brother said to him, Shall you indeed reign over us, or shall you indeed have dominion over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Then he dreamed still another dream and told it to his brothers and said, Look, I have dreamed another dream. And this time the sun, the moon, and the eleven stars bowed down to me. So he told it to his father and his brothers. And his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall your mother and I and your brothers indeed come to bow down to the earth before you? And his brothers envied him. And his father kept the matter in mind. Any observations, any things that you noted, anything that you saw, anything that caught your eye uh, about, about this, this text, the beginning of this story? Yes, please. Well, there were several things, perhaps not necessarily biblical, but I, I'm not a parent. I don't have any kids. I understand that people that do have kids that sometimes one child is better behaved than the other. Sometimes one child listens to you more than the other children do. Sometimes one child gives you love. Less challenges than other children do, mm -hmm. but you know, my parents always tried very hard to not show favorites. That's right. And he was, Jacob was open in his favoritism to his son Joseph. Very much so. I don't think that's necessarily right. And right. then right. he's 17, he's old enough to have gotten a little bit of wisdom, and he says, You know, I've, I've, I've heard these dreams. Neener, neener, you know. Uh, look at me, look at you. That's uh, right, that's right. May not be exactly the thinking he had, but I'm thinking, you know, some things it's just better to shut up about. Some <laughs> like, you know, that's right. Some things that's it's right. better to not tell people about, you know. <laughs> some lady in church, and you say, gee, that dress really makes you look fat. Yeah, uh, you know, some things go without saying. <laughs> you know, yeah, you, you, you really have to. I mean, really, really, right? I mean, yeah. yeah. There are times to keep your mouth shut, and yeah, that that that's that that's that, that's so true. Yeah, we do. We we we'll see that we'll see the spoiling of of Joseph in this. We'll see the the lack of wisdom uh, from from Jacob, who should have known better. How did Jacob's story start? His father preferred Esau. And he, he knew the pain of favoritism. He knew the pain of being that 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 uh, that uh, that other son. And now, when he has children, and by the way, he has thirteen. <laughs> he has thirteen. He he picks Joseph as as his favorite, and he lavishes him 
uh, with his favor and he lavishes him with the tunic. And we'll see the, the, the meaning, meaning of that. And, and we also see Joseph's uh, uh, lack of maturity. We also see Joseph's uh, 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 foolish, uh, foolish actions that exacerbated his situation and his circumstances. Uh, uh, yet, uh, so, so a absolutely, some, some very, very key points to what we'll see about Joseph uh, 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 tonight. Anything, anything else? Yes, Michelle. I'm going to kind of, I'm going to kind of give Jacob a little bit of reprieve here. Okay. I mean, he, he, it's, it's very likely that maybe he realized that he didn't father his other sons well enough when they were young and spend time with them, and now he had a son in his old age because it said it was his son of his old mm -hmm. age. Yeah. You know, and so maybe a touch of it was not really, he didn't realize what he was doing, you know, yeah. maybe yeah. just, just for a small argument for him, because it, it is wrong. I mean, he, he shouldn't have well, him. And, and him. like you but, said, there, there's some consideration but, there. One, one scholar that I read behind said that, that, uh, that, uh, at Jacob's age, he was more a grandfather mm -hmm. and he had more chilled out in his older age yeah. and he enjoyed, he enjoyed the raising of this child, especially. Plus, you got to realize the Bible only says Jacob loved one of his wives. Mm -hmm. He had four, by the way, thirteen kids. Who was the woman that he loved? Rebecca, Joseph. I mean, no, Rachel. Not Rachel. Yeah, Rachel. Yeah. Rachel. Rachel. He loved. Ra he loved Rachel. Rachel had given birth to Benjamin a year earlier, and in giving birth to Benjamin, she passed. So every time he looked at Joseph. He was seeing Rachel. And so, so there, there were some fact, factors that didn't justify what he did, but it maybe gives us a little, bit, uh, a little better understanding of why he so favored uh, Joseph. Plus, Benjamin was at this point was too young uh, to, 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 really, to really pour that kind of affection uh, on, onto. Any other observations that you noticed about, about uh, Joseph uh, in, the, in the story or any of the characters in, in the story? It mentioned that he was given a multicolored garment. Mm -hmm. At that time, all the dyes would have been naturally sourced. They would have been hard to create, would have taken a considerable amount of time. And to have many colors in one garment probably represented a lot of time and a lot of money or, well, that's right. or a lot of time, a lot of time and a lot of labor. So that in and of itself shows how the boy was favored. Absolutely, absolutely. It, it was a it, it was a it was a show of, of, of exorbitance from Dad, but it also had a cultural meaning behind it. Jacob was declaring to all of his other sons, "I don't care who's the firstborn. Jacob, I mean Joseph, was the, my favorite. Joseph will rule over you. Joseph will be the head. You see, the tunic wasn't a gar a gar a garment that that the shepherds wore." And tunic was the garment that the firstborn wore. The tunic was the garments that the supervisors wore. You didn't have a lot of room. It went all the way down to your to your uh, to your arms. It went all the way down uh, uh, to your feet. It was elaborate. Uh, it not something that you want to, to to get to get dirty by wrestling sheep or whatever whatever you had to do there. It was more a it was more a declaration that he is your supervisor. No matter how he, he's 17 years old, he had older brothers, and Jacob sent him out there to watch them. And one place said, one place said that the word the, the, that, that what the word that, that was used there was to shepherd them. Not to shepherd the sheep, but to shepherd the brothers. Can you can imagine the resentment? How many anybody from a large family? Brothers and sisters? I, yeah, I, I was I was one of five. Uh, the dynamic there is insane. It really is. It really is. If you if you want a if you want a, 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 a formula for trouble, if you want a formula for psychological issues, you know I, I believe large families can, can be just that because there's so many characters, there's so much drama, there's so much uh, so much going on. Any other observations that you see as we look at at at, uh, at, at this text? Yes. I had one other thing. Um, I had never noticed before that it says that after he told his dad. That it said, but his father kept the matter in mind. I had never really noticed that. That so he is like he was contemplating: is there validity to what Joseph has dreamed? That, that's right. That's right. Mm -hmm. Did Jacob have a dream? Mm -hmm. Anybody remember? 
ladder. The ladder. The night that he ran away, from, run for his life from Esau, he laid down, he used the rock for a stone, and he dreamed of a ladder which angels was ascending and de descending. And he woke up the, the, that morning and he named that place Bethel because he had, he had, a, he had an encounter with God. Jacob, I believe Jacob realized that what Joseph was experiencing was not earthly. That what Joseph was experiencing was supernatural. And, 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 and I believe because of that, uh, he, he, he turned around, he, he turned around and, and he kept it in his mind. Does that, does that phrase echo somebody else that we know of? The Bible says that Mary stored up all those things in her, uh, in the, that, that the wise men had told her about, about Jesus Christ and the shepherd. Had, they stored up, stored up all the other things. And which, which is, by the way, a parallel that we're going to see a lot in our study, and that is that is that that Joseph parallels Jesus Christ. Joseph was the suffering savior. Joseph was the one who came and gave his all to save the world. Uh, in this study, we're going to see again and again uh, the, the the Old Testament character that seems to bear forth the the most characteristics of Jesus Christ is Joseph. Joseph responded as Jesus would respond. Joseph, uh, Joseph suffered as, as Jesus would suffer. So we're going to see, we're going to see, a, we're going to see a, a great deal of that uh, uh, in, in this study. Any other observations before we, before we, we jump in? So this is our, our, our first lesson, and our first lesson entitled, Here Comes That Dreamer. That's actually what his brothers said about him. In just a few verses later, when they saw him coming to him, they called him that dreamer, and so that we're going to take that we're going to take that uh, uh, to springboard in, into this study, the springboard into what uh, into what uh, we we have here. Uh, I, I read a story uh, this week uh, by a young man who who went to a to a college and he had a football scholarship and. And of all the other peers in his class and all the other other classmates, he had one that was a very special person to him, and that her name was Rose. Now, what made Rose so special was not because she was a, a beautiful, attractive girl. What made Rose so special was that Rose was 87 years old. Rose had went back to college. Rose was determined to get her degree. Rose was determined to uh, to learn and to grow, and it was it was so exciting to her. And she was just so full of life. And everybody, everybody that was everybody that knew her, and everybody that was around her, quickly fell in love with with Rose. And uh, and especially the football team. The football team was in classes with her, and, and they, they loved to sit around and hear her stories and hear what she had to say. So at the end of the year, they asked their coach, they said, hey, we need a speaker for our football banquet. How about Rose? And so they asked Rose, and she was thrilled, and she said, I'll try. And so the night of the football banquet, Rose came in. She had a stack of index cards with her speech on it. And, and when the floor was turned over to her, she walked up to the front of the, uh, of the podium. And the first thing she did is she dropped all of her index cards. And as, as the team rushed up to, to help her grab the cards together, she said, oh, just leave them alone. I'll never get that speech in order again. She said, so I'm just going to share just a few things where I feel like you need to know. She said, from, from, from my vantage point, who have lived a, a, a full and, and, and a happy life, she said, I want, I want to tell you some things that you, that you, need, to, that you need to realize. Here's what, what she told them. She said, you got to have a dream. When you lose your dreams, you die. We have some people walking around who are dead and don't even know it yet. Have no regrets. The elderly usually don't have regrets for what we did, but rather for things we did not do. And she said the only people who fear death are those with regrets. She said if you want to live a full life, if you want to live a purposeful life, if you want to live a life that has meaning and joy and excitement, she said you got to have a dream. At 87 years old, she still had dreams. At 87 years old, she was still uh, moving forward. Every success story, no matter what the arena, sports or business or what, every success story comes from people who had a dream and who had a goal. Businesses these days understand something, that, we, that they had to develop a, a vision statement. You can even go to restaurants now and see on the walls a vision statement. Every company has. Why? Because they realize the reason that we're not succeeding is we don't have a dream. 
Now, I'm not talking about just any kind of dream here uh, when it comes to Joseph. And I'm not just talking about any kind of dream uh, that we pursue here. I'm talking about a very special kind of dream. The kind of dream that is in Proverbs. Notice what it said in Proverbs 29, 18. It reads like this. And this is the King James Version because I want you to realize it. He said, where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law happy is he. So, so it, this is what this is what this is the kind of vision that that uh, that that we're going to be looking at. What is this vision? That word vision in the Hebrew simply means dream, or it means revelation. In the New King James Version, they translate this word revelation. It denotes a God-given vision. It denotes a vision that God has planted in our lives and in our hearts. You know, we live in we live in a, we live in a world in which. Uh, in which the gospel has become a me gospel. It's become a, a gospel that's all about how God wants to bless you, how God wants to teach you, how God wants to do all these wonderful things about you. And it seems like if you were an outsider listening in, this, this, our modern day gospel seems to be a gospel that people would say, well, that's all about you. And I got some bad news for you. It's not. And the dream that God wants to do and fulfill in your life is not your dream. It's not your vision for success. It's not your vision for riches. It's not your vision for, for, the, for all these things. It is the vision that he has for you. It's the design that he has for your life. God wants you to embrace his dream for you, to pursue his dream for you. That's exactly what Joseph did. That's exactly uh, the role that Joseph played uh, here in the word of God. Now this book, if we really narrow it down, and we really, uh, we really look at it and take a serious look, this book is an occasion after occasion after occasion of stories of men and women who decided to grab a hold of God's dream. I mean, from the very first of Genesis, as we see here, all the way through the Bible, it's, it's people who decided to listen to what God wanted to, to, to say, to do what God wanted them to do, to be what God wanted them to be. It was a matter of, of pursuing God's dream in their life. And we learned some things from those stories. First of all, we learned that we were never too old to dream. How old was Moses when, the burning, when he stood in front of the burning bush? He was 80 years old. Old. When God, when he finally embraced, uh, the, I believe years earlier, I believe 40 years earlier, it, God, it, it, he had already begun it stirring in his heart. I believe it's what drove him to kill uh, the, 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 the one that was beating the Israelite because he felt that his role was the, to be the savior of his people. And, uh, but it was only 40, it was 40 years later that he really embraced that call at the burning bush. We also learned that we're never too insignificant. When, when, uh, when Samuel came to anoint a, a new king and uh, God's instructions, uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, D uh, David's dad didn't even include him. He was out on the hillside. Oh, that's just David. David, David you know, I got taller boys. I got stronger boys. I got, I got more charismatic boys. And he didn't include him. He was too insignificant in the eyes of his own family, but he was not too insignificant for God to use him in his plan. We also, we also learned that we're never too far gone for God to include us in his plan. God would transform the New Testament by picking a Christian murderer, one that slaughtered entire families of Christians by the name of Paul on the road to Damascus. And he would say, you're not too far gone. And, 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 and in the conversion of the apostle Paul, he taught us a very powerful and significant thing. He taught us here uh, in, in the word of God that we are not too far gone for God to plant in us his vision and, and his grace. So, uh, so what, what does it mean for us? Do we, have, do, does, do we each have a plan from God? Do we each have a dream that God wants to fulfill in our life? You know, we hear a lot about it. Preachers teach about it. Preachers talk about, about it a lot. But is it truly biblical? Why don't you notice what Paul says to the Ephesians? In Ephesians 2 and, and 10, he said this. For we are his workmanship. I, and I like the fact that that literal word there is we are his masterpiece. That, that's what it is. We are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus for what? Good works. 
which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. He's not talking about a few good works. He's not talking about a few things that we do nicely or kindly. He's talking about good works that we walk in that was prepared beforehand for us. We have been shaped, we're being molded, we are being, we are being made his workmanship for a purpose. And that purpose is God's plan and God's desire for our life. That is the story of Joseph. Joseph shows us what it means to embrace the vision of God. He shows us what it means to have a God-given dream in his life and, and, he, and to pursue that dream with all of his heart. I love the book. I love the story of Joseph because Joseph takes us through uh, so many processes that he went through. It only took God 24 hours to take Joseph from a prison cell to the palace throne in Egypt. But before that, it took him 13 years of incubation. 13 years to get him to that point. 13 years to shape the man that he was. 13 years to make the man fit the dream. And that's exactly what happened uh, with, with Joseph. Joseph had to be transformed. He had to be changed. We saw in our study of David, didn't we, how God, how God took a, a rough cut young shepherd boy that had a love for God and he made him into a king. We're going to see in much the same in Joseph's life, but we're going to see how Joseph would embrace the vision that God had for his life to change everything around him. 13 years that God would do to you to use this. So let's look at some of the principles that Joseph teaches us and his story teaches us about this dream or this vision we're going to talk about. Because this is, this is what we need to understand. First of all, we need to see where vision starts. Joseph shows us where vision can start in our life and how vision works in, in, in our life. Notice where it started in Joseph's life here. Verse number one. Now Jacob dwelled in the land where his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan. This was the promised land before it was the promised land. This was God's place before it was anything else. But I believe that the significance of where Joseph was, its significance was in its insignificance. <laughs> does, that, does that make sense? sense to you? It is significant simply because it's, a, it's on the backside of nowhere. It's significant because it's not a great city. It's significant because it's not a powerful walled uh, 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 kingdom. It's significant because there's nothing truly significant about this land of Cana that w was there. And God likes starting his vision in insignificant places. God likes starting his vision in insignificant people. Where did he find Gideon? Hiding in the threshing floors from the enemies that God would use him to defeat. Where did he find Moses? Moses was on the backside of nowhere leading a group of sheep when all of a sudden God started a fire in a bush that, wouldn't go up, that just wouldn't go out. Where did he find David? He had to be, they, people had to go pull him out of the field where he was just simply watching over, over sheep. God likes to, to, to call us in those places, in the place that in significant places and insignificant times in our lives. And I believe, this, I believe he does that for a very, for a very good reason. He wants, he wants us to understand. He wants us to embrace uh, how, how he truly w wants to work. You see, he wants us to realize that, that his vision starts where we are. Every time God chooses a great man, a great woman of God, they're broken. They're, they're, they're not fit for their assignment. They're, they're not there yet. Joseph was 13 years away from being what God would have him to be. God knew that Joseph wasn't fit to sit on the throne of Egypt or to save anybody for that point, at the point that he was at. Jo he, would, he would start this vision in the heart of a 17-year-old spoiled boy, that's what he was, who was strutting around in a multicolored coat bragging about his favor with dad but, and, and that's what he started with. That's what God first planted this vision and this dream in the heart of this young man in his life. He was 17 years old. He was, he was, the, he was the, the, uh, one of two sons of, of Rachel. He was a shepherd. 
Uh, and, and, and the Bible goes on to tell us just one more thing about, about Joseph. He had brought a bad report about his brothers. Now, the report wasn't significant enough to mention what it was. It wasn't bad enough that, that he, he needed to call a trial for it. He was just tattling on his brothers. He was just basically stirring up a relationship that was already aflame. That was already, he was getting even because he realized, look at this coat, guys. I'm dad's favorite. Touch me. Touch me. And, 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 see, if, and see what will happen. Do something to me and see what will take place in your life. So we see that God wants to use us before anything really happens in our life. And that tells me something. That tells me that oftentimes God plants in us a dream or a vision that we're not ready for. A dream or a vision that we're not fit for. A dream and a vision that shows us what he desires to do with our life and with our hearts, but we are not, we are not anywhere near the point that, that we need to be uh, with God. You see, God's vision was in the heart of Moses long before Moses led his children out. Like I said earlier, uh, I believe it was the, the incentive that drove him to kill uh, the, the, the guard that was beating the children of Israel because he, something rose up in him when he saw that his people being mistreated. And even though he was dressed in all the, all the garb of the palace and dressed as, as, the, as, the, as an Egyptian royalty, uh, something rose up within him. I believe it was that, that those very first yearnings and those very, where that, 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 that dream of God had already been planted in him. But it would be 40 years later before God would call, would truly re-energize and re-bring bring that guy. So where are you? Are you where you can do great things from God? You might not be. But you may very well be at that very place in your life where God can plant in you his dream. Where God can plant in you what he wants you to be. And that goes along with the second thing that I want you to notice about Joseph. It starts how we are. It starts how we are. What do you mean by how we are? It, it starts in the play, in, in the condition that God finds us in. I, one thing I love about the Word of God is the Word of God doesn't play around and candy coat people's lives. It doesn't make everybody out to be a great hero. It doesn't make everybody out to be flawless. It doesn't make everybody out to be perfect. As a matter of fact, it does the exact opposite. It shines a floodlight on their inabilities. It shines a floodlight on, on their flaws. One thing that I found to be kind of confusing is in, in, in my studies of, the, of this passage, I found that there was a number of, of commentaries that, that simply said that Joseph did absolutely nothing wrong. That it was all on the fault of his brothers and his father, and he was just an innocent, innocent bystander. You know, and I'm like, guys, he wasn't Jesus. You know, He was flawed. He was a normal 17-year-old boy who desired the affections of his father, and he quickly embraced the affections of his father. He didn't hide that tunic in the closet in his tent. He didn't tuck it away. He was wearing it when they threw him in the pit. He was wearing it to show who he was and what he was. He had embraced that favor. He had become that spoiled boy, and then all of a sudden something, something, something extreme happened. God gave him a dream. And as Bruce pointed out, the first thing that he did, he said, guys, I got to tell you what this dream says. He said, well, there, there, was, there was these sheaves, each of us uh, representing uh, of, uh, of us, and my sheep ro rose above your sheaves, and all your sheaves just bowed. He was in a dysfunctional family. This was a messed up family. This was a family that God would use to build Israel. All of these brothers was representing a tribe of Israel. You don't should realize that. But all of them were messed up. They hated Joseph. And that word was not a light word. They would, they would initially attempt to kill Joseph. They would initially kill, attempt to destroy Joseph. They despised him. They couldn't even talk kindly toward him. I, I know that Jacob saw in their eyes the hatred and the, and the despite and the despite that they held for, for, for Joseph. I know that Joseph was aware of it. And he wasn't so foolish to realize that, that if he told this dream what it would do to his brothers. I believe he was saying, nah, 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 nah. I'm great and you're not. I'm big and you're not. God understood something. 
that the man that God needed and he knew that Joseph would be would be a man that would not be that man in his father's house. That would be a man that would only be shaped by suffering. That would be only be shaped by pain. That would be only be shaped into the king that God needed him to be. Compassionate to the least of them. Compassionate to the people around him. After he had gone through 13 years of testing and 13 years of trying. God sees our flaws. And I, as I said the other Sunday, God loves us as we are, but he loves us too much to leave us as we are. He wants to shape us and to mold us into the character that he wants us to be. So, we, so if you feel like you're disqualified, guess what you are? But guess what? God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called. He takes those people and he plants within their hearts and in their minds the, the, tr the, true, the true call that God has uh, for, for their life. It starts with who we are in our life. He was naive. He was immature. He was spoiled for, by, by every way. And on top of that, daddy gave him the coat of the firstborn. A coat that was costly. A coat that took a lot of work and a lot of, uh, no doubt, in, uh, the, back then you didn't just go to, into tunics or us. You just didn't get, get that. So obviously the, his wives had worked long and hard to, to, to make up this, to the dyes and to make up this glorious coat. I believe many of them hated doing that. My son was born first and I've got to make a coat for this brat. You know, it, it, was, it, was, it was a formula for disaster. It was a formula for psychological. A psychologist would love to eat this up and have Joseph and all of his brothers on their couches. It was messed up family. That's what Joseph came out of. And that coat was a coat that was not meant to be functional. It was meant to be a coat of authority. It was meant, it was worn, those were tunics were worn by royalty in, that, in, those, in those times. It simply said, I don't work, you do I just stand back and tell you what, what to do. That's how Joseph was in this situation uh, in his life. And on top of that, Joseph brings a bad report to, 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 to their father. He brings a bad report to them, and he stirs up that, and then he brings up not one dream, but two. And as Bruce pointed out, Sometimes we got to have the discernment to realize when God is speaking to us and not to everybody. I believe that second dream was a confirmation of the first one for, for Joseph. I believe what it was saying to Joseph is although they don't believe in you, I'm going to make it stronger. I'm going to make it even clearer. I'm going to make a, the specific number of stars your brothers. I want to I wanna, I wanna, I wanna make you it, it be obvious uh, that, that, that not only are the brothers going to bow, but your dad is going to bow before you as well. I believe this was a confirmation to the 17-year-old boy's heart that I've got something great in store for you. And what's the first thing that Joseph did? He busts out of that tent after knowing how they responded to the first dream. And he goes to them and says, guess what God showed me now? And it was so disturbing that Jacob rebuked him. Jacob woke up. Jacob realized, I've created a monster. Jacob realized, I've spoiled him, I've done all these things, and, and now what I, what I have to do is I have to, I, have to, I have to put an end to this. I have to stop this dream talk. I have to stop this other talk because it's putting, it's putting Joseph in danger. It's, 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 it's stirring up. Um, any dad understands that, that when your kids are at each other's neck, you've got to put an end to it because it's not going to get better. You've got to put an end to it because it has to be dealt with. That was how Joseph was when God decided to give him that dream. When God decided, here's the plan I have for you. When God decided, here is what I want to work in your life. It was a formula uh, uh, for, 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 for disaster. But I want you to also really notice something else. I want you to notice when visions, a vision starts. Not just where it starts. It starts where you are. It starts how you are. But I want you to realize when this vision starts uh, uh, in, 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 in this entire story that he, that he shows us here. You see, God, uh, God immediately began to activate in, in Joseph his plan once 
Joseph embraced his plan. Once Joseph said, that's my dream. Once Joseph took it in uh, for him, he didn't understand it. As a matter of fact, Joseph thought it was all about him. 13 years later, he realized it's not about me at all. It's about the world. It's about God. It's about God's dream. It's about the nation of Israel. It's about all, it was about everything else but about me. God began to reveal to him and demonstrate to him where it started. It became the turning point in Joseph's life. There's a quote that I really love by by uh, Patrick Morley that said, put it this way. He said, the turning point in our lives is when we stop seeking God, uh, the, seeking the God we want, and start seeking the God who is. That's what Joseph did. He began to give himself and turn himself over to that kind of God. And guess what? When you embrace the, the, the vision of God and the dream of God for your life, and you hear God, and you know that that's God's leading for your life, Hang on, buckle up, you're in for the wildest ride of your life. Because what will take you there is not what you expect will take you there. What you'll experience on the way to fulfilling what God has for your life, Joseph demonstrates here in the Word of God, it's not all roses, it's not all honor, it's not all glory. Sometimes there's pain waiting uh, for us. But how does it start in our life? It starts, first of all, when we abandon our plan. Proverbs is constant about this. There's quote after quote of talking about the, the difference between God's plan and our, and, and, and our plan. Proverbs 16 and 9 says, A man heart, man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. Uh, in another place it says, it says that, that, that plenty are the, are the plans of man, but, but, but only God's plans prevails. He, the, uh, Solomon understood something. Solomon understands you can have all the visions and the dreams that you want, but unless it's a God-given dream, God is under no obligation to fulfill it in your life. But if you grab a hold of God's dream in your life and let go of your own plans and your own dreams, that's what greatness is born out of. That's what great things are born out of. People were called from the craziest jobs and the craziest situations, shepherds, uh, 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 cup bearers, and men, men that did just simple things. And, and they were called from that to be something greater. Fishermen were called by Jesus on the shore. Leave your boats, leave your nets, abandon your plan, abandon your dream. I've got a bigger dream. I've got a better dream for your life. We have to be willing to abandon that plan in our life. You see, there's three plans that we have to be able to recognize in our life. And we got to know the difference of these plans. Because if we don't know the difference of these plans, uh, two out of the three of them means complete and total disaster for us. First of all, there's our plan. Secondly, there's Satan's plan for your life. You know Satan has a plan for your life? Oh, he, he, he has big plans for your life. And then there's God's plan for our life. How I discern between those three, you got to dis discover who they are about. First of all, your plan is only about you. Satan's plan is about evil and about pleasure and about doing what he desires you to do. God's plan is about what he intends to do and his team. And once we begin to discern that and to know that, we can recognize. It. Now, Satan's plan and your plan can go hand in hand. It can. It can work in tandem. But God's plan can't work with your plan, and God's plan can't work with Satan's plan. God's plan stands on its own. Own. We need to understand that. So it means that we must understand and embrace the fact that we have to first abandon our plan, no matter how gifted we are or blessed we are. And let me tell you that God's plan is not always a pulpit plan. Joseph wasn't a preacher. Joseph wasn't a prophet. Joseph was a man that God used mightily in dreams, but his greatest skill was he was a manager in government. That was his skill. That was his God-given skill. That was his God-given anointing. He would, he, would make, he would reach heights that the patriarchs never reached. He would reach more people than all the, 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 the generations that was before him for God. He would make a name for Israel, and he would make a nation for, for Israel. Why? Because here was a man that said, Lord God, it's not about me. It's about you. I want to be what I saw in that dream. I want to do what you called me to, to do uh, in that dream. And one of the most powerful things about this plan that God has for us is once Joseph grabbed a hold of it, something else truly, truly happened uh, in his life. It's when God's plan has us. 
When we embrace what God wants us to be and what God wants us to do, once that happens, it's hard to shape that thing. It really is. Why? Because God's plan begins to work in our lives and work in us. And it, it, it basically consumes us. That's what Joseph did. Joseph couldn't shake that dream. For 13 years, in the worst of situations or circumstance, Joseph couldn't. Uh, when, when, when all the circumstances said, you'll never be what you dreamed that you are going to be, Joseph still believed. Joseph still stood the test of time and the, te and the test of, of the certain situation. Why? Because he understood something. That <laughs> dream is more than just a night where I had pizza. That dream is a night which, which God wanted to use me and, and be with me. And can, I, can I tell you, I, I'm, I'm speaking from experience in that, in, that, in that once you grab a hold of the call that is upon your life, it's not easy to shake that call. I spent decades in the business world, always knowing in the back of my mind, there's coming a time when, you're just gonna, when God's going to say enough, and he did, and he's going to plant me right back in the ministry. Well, not because it made me better than people in the business world. It's because my calling was in ministry. And when we decided, when we decided to, to step back in the, in the pastoral work and, and, and we called our son, which is not walking with God, and we're on a conversation with him, Michelle, Michelle blurted out, hey, guess what your dad's going, going to do now? Joel was like, what? He says, he's going back to pastor." Now, my pastor before Joel was too small to remember me pastor. But on the other end of the line, I heard this, ha, <laughs> ha, so you just couldn't stay away from me, could you, Dad? And it meant something to me. But when we hung up the phone, I looked at Michelle, I said, that sounds like someone who understands the power of a call. So from that point on, I began to believe that God's got a call on my boy's life that he won't be able to shake, <laughs> that he won't be able to j j just ignore it. He can, he can disobey God, he can do it, but he'll constantly be coming back. It'll constantly be having a hold of, because he, see, God's plan is what makes our heart beat. God's plan is what drives us to great things. God's plan is that that satisfies us. My dad, as far as he knew, was the first preacher in his family, as far as we knew. His dad, had a heart attack and was on his deathbed. And he was called in and he, he, he shared this story many times uh, with me. He, he was called in and his dad was in the tent. Remember the old tents they used to put them in? And he walked up to the side of his dad bed and his dad said, son, unzip the tent, stick your hand, stick your hand in here and grab a hold of my hand. And he did. And he said with all the hoses and everything that he was hooked up to, he said his dad with tears in his eyes looked over at him and said, son, I'm proud of you. He said, I'm proud of you for a very selfish reason. What you did, God called me to do. I, he said, I should have been in the pulpits. I should have been preaching the gospel. He said, I, I run a business. He said, he said, I was a journalist. I did, I did all those things. But deep within me, I kept hearing this pull and kept hearing this strain and kept hearing this call upon my life. He said, he said I wish I would have said yes. I wish I would have embraced what God had for my life. Where would, could, would we be different? He said, you're doing today what I'm so thankful that you're doing. I'm so proud of you because you're a preacher, a man of God. And can I tell you that your obedience impacts other people's obedience? Wasn't long after that that my dad's brother became a preacher. Dad had four sons. Three out of three of them uh, was preachers. He has grandchildren now that, that, that are involved in, in ministry. When we obey God, we show a pattern in people's life that God's plan is worth pursuing. And the joy of embracing something that embraces us back. The joy of saying, and some, uh, you know, some people are like, you know, I was talking recently, somebody said, it's kind of tough to go through your week being an administrator and dealing with all those things and then to have to preach. I'm like, no, you don't, you don't get it right. Because I do that so I can preach. <laughs> I said, that's the joy. That's the call. 
That's the, that's the area of my life. The, 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 being in the Word of God on Wednesday night is what I love to do. Teaching is what I love to do. It's, it's, it's what makes my heart beat. It's, it was what, what I live for in our life. So we need to understand, you know it's God's calling because when you say yes to it, it responds to you. And it grabs a hold of you. So we need to realize that it starts in our life. Oh, uh, when we abandon our plan. And it starts when God's plan has us. And then, thirdly, I want you to notice what, what vision imparts in our life. Vision imparts some things. Vision gives us some things that we don't have. As a matter of fact, vision and the dream that God plants in our life is almost like a sixth sense in our life. And because it gives us and it provides us with something that we that we that we that we didn't realize that we needed, <laughs> uh, it provides us with some some, uh, some some principles that we didn't realize that 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 we need to grab hold of. As, as Michelle pointed out, verse number eleven is significant here. And his brothers envied him, but his father kept the matter in mind. The father understood something. He understood that he, he actually had chosen the right guy for the firstborn to pass down the promise of God to the generations that would follow, to lead where his brothers were incapable of leading, to do what God had called him to do. Why? Because he saw in him the thing that was driving Jacob. Jacob was driven by a dream. Jacob was driven by a vision. And what he saw in what he saw in this young man was, was powerful. What he saw in, in this young man was great. Because you see, he understood something. To make it through where he needed to go through and what he needed to go through, he needed a dream. Years ago, on my honeymoon, believe it or not, we went down to, to Savannah. I was, I was pastoring a little storefront and God was speaking a lot of the, a lot of these truths into my life and he was showing me and he was beginning to plant that dream in my heart. And uh, I, I found myself in a, there was a mega church in, 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 in Savannah, which I was uh, pastoring a little four square church. And it was a huge four square church. And the Sunday that we were there, we sat in this, that service and we heard the announcement that, uh, that the associate pastor there had just accepted a church in Columbia, which is about an hour away from us. It, was the, it, it would be the closest four square church to us. And so I, after church, I walked up to this pastor and I congratulated him. I, I, he said, you're kidding me. I said, no, I said, no. He said, he said you're good. He said, he said that's, that's fantastic. And then he began to tell me all the things that God had confirmed about their mood. God had said about their mood. The vision that God had planted in their life. And I, I looked at this, this man and I, I said something really off the cuff because it was just something God was speaking in my life at the time. And I didn't really didn't even have any depth to it at all. But I said, you know why God gives you those visions? He said, why? I said, because you're going to need them. You're going to need to be able to lean on those. You're going to need to be able in the tough times to say, but God said. You're going to need to be able in that situation to hold on to, to those principles in your life. And his eyes got about this big. And he said, wife, he yelled across that picture, wife, come here, come here, come here. And she come running down the aisle, aisle to him. She said, he said, now tell her what you just told me. And I told her. And her eyes got as big. And she said, you know, that's just what I've been hearing from God. That the reason I'm giving you this dream is because you're going to need it. You see, what does, what does this dream give us? You see, this, this dream gives us, first of all, a sense of belonging. I like that. It gives us a sense of belonging. Not just belonging to God's, to God's people, not just belonging to God's church, but belonging in God's plan. One of the characteristics that you're going to see again and again in the life of Joseph is this powerful principle. No matter where Joseph was, Joseph realized I'm where I'm supposed to be. No matter what the circumstances or the situation, which were always out of his hands for 13 years, he realized I belong here because in God's plan, in God's purpose, in God's in this in this situation, uh, this is where I need to belong. He got into prison and he became the chief prison person. He got in Potiphar's house, and he became the chief, uh, the, the, the trusted with the entire house of Potiphar. He worked hard to do the, to be the best at the worst in the worst situations. 
He worked hard. Why? Because he had a sense of belonging. That dream told him, you're right where you're supposed to be. That's not an easy thing to do. A few, months, a few weeks back, we saw, well, we went to one of the theaters and watched Daniel, which was a sight and sound production that, that, uh, of their new show, Daniel, that they're having uh, uh, <clears throat> soon in their stage productions. And there was a song there that really struck me at its meaning. Daniel was praying, and the words of that song, Daniel simply said this. Daniel said, Lord, I want to be where you are, even if it's here. And where here was, was Babylon. Where here was, was, was the wickedest place on the earth. Where here was, well, but, but Daniel had a sense of belonging. He realized, that's where I belong because that's, because I grabbed a hold of God's dream. And God's dream has no pit stops which leaves us and, and abandons us. It is shaping us and molding us for our life. So we need to understand, uh, understand. So what do we need to do? We need to stop complaining about where we are. We need to stop to be complaining about what God has brought into our lives. Because if we are part of God's plan, all things are working together for the good, to them that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. What does that require? That requires me to love God and to have embraced his call upon my life and his direction. So it gives us a sense of belonging. It also brings to our lives a sense of enabling. When did the dream start for Joseph? When the plan of God started for Joseph. You see, one thing you need to realize is God's plan did not start with a coat of many colors. That was Dad's plan. God's plan started with a pit that Joseph would be thrown into. What a, what a terrible start, right? right? But, oh, God had some great things in store. Uh, and I believe the people that, that endure and make it through some of the greatest suffering had some of the greatest stories and had some of the greatest triumphs. Why? Because God knows what they will need to accomplish what they need to accomplish. He began to enable him with a gift. That gift was what? Management. Was that? Management. Management was, was definitely one of his gifts. But what was the spiritual, supernatural gift that he manifested again and again? Uh, be able to uh, tell somebody what their dream means. That's right. Interpretation. Dream interpretation. He, God was using. Uh, uh, you know, <laughs> how do you know it's a gift from God? <laughs> and here, here, and here, here's a thought that he didn't make out across you. You might. If that gift is for somebody else but you, if that gift is to minister to others, God could have given him a dream saying, 13 years, buddy, you're going to go through this, you're going to go through that, you're going to go to the other. He, his dream never blessed him until the very end. His dream never benefited him. And even at the very end, he didn't suggest that, that he be the one that be benefited. He was suggesting that somebody else take care, care of that situation. And Pharaoh said, no, it's you. See, we need to understand that in our life, we need to embrace the giftings that God has. But if God calls you to, 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 to pursue in your life his calling, he will enable you in your calling. He will anoint you in that calling. He will give you the ability in that calling. Joseph already had the giftings, and those giftings would carry him in the worst of times. Those giftings would bless him when no, nothing else would bless him in his, in his, in his life. You see, he, uh, uh, and, and notice that Joseph didn't experience dreams every day. Joseph didn't see significance in every dream. He didn't see, uh, uh, we, we don't hear of any dreams that he had after this dream uh, hit himself. He was just, God spoke to him about other people's dreams and, 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 and interpreted their dreams. He, he used that. Uh, be careful about this idea about supernatural dreams. There's some people that take it way too far. That, 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 make, that attaches this meaning to, to, to this thing and this meaning. And, you know, I, I read one author today that said he had a friend that left God and left his wife because a dream told him to. You know, we have to be careful. We, we have to know when it's God and discern when it's God in his life. Now, I've experienced, I've experienced myself some what I believe is truly God-given dreams 
in my life. But and 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 I, I can I, I can tell you they're very radically different from every other dream I have. I had dreams. I wake up in the morning and I'm like, I know I've dreamed, but I can't tell you what I've dreamed. I know it was significant. I know it was emotional. I know it was, but I can't tell you. And that's most of the time in my dream. But when I dream a dream that I believe is from God, I wake up and I vividly remember all of the details. And I instantly know what it means. Since if the Holy Spirit says, here it is, and it just lays it out before. And in most cases in my life, it's, it's not matters of, of church matters and these things. Well, most of the times, they're encouragements to me. Most of the times, they're strengthening to me. Most of the times, they're ministering that the Holy Spirit uh, does in my life. And it's the confirmations of things that God is speaking in, in my heart and my, my life. But we have to be able to discern that and realize that this vision gives us a sense of enabling. It gives us a sense that we can do what we need uh, to do. It also gives us a, a, a sense of direction. When we realize the way we're going and what we're heading toward, things matter that didn't matter before. One man said, digging, digging, uh, digging dirt, putting it in a bag has no significance unless there's a tsunami coming. And then you dig with a different passion. You dig with a different purpose because you know that you're saving your family's life. You know that you're going to build a wall of sandbags to protect your family and your home. And he said that's the difference in someone who has direction in their lives, that has a purpose in their life, that has a focus in their life. And this, this vision gives us that sense of direction. This vision gives us that sense of purpose in, in our life. Joseph didn't have to consider whether he was going to sleep with Potiphar's wife or not. It was not the direction that he was going in. He was going in the direction to please God. He was going in the direction to follow God. He was following that vision uh, that, that, that Proverbs talked about that was in conjunction with the law of God, with the will of God in his life. It will give you a sense of direction. When you know where you're trying to go and when you know what you're trying to do, you, you can easily push aside the distractions and easily say, no, that's not my purpose and that's not my reason. That's what Joseph understood. Joseph didn't know why he was in the pit. He didn't know why he would be in the prison. He didn't know why he would be in Potiphar's house. He didn't know why he had spent 13 years under the thumb of somebody else. But all he knew is this is part of where I'm going. This is part of what God is doing. So it gives us a sense of direction. And then finally, it gives us a sense of indestructibility. <laughs> when we realize that we are part of God's plan and God's promise, we can be bolder than some people. I've heard people say, God's not through with me yet. I'm not dying. And I've seen them outlive situations and circumstances because they had a purpose. And I saw God use them mightily and, and in pow powerful ways. We had that indestructibility uh, a lot. Proverbs 19, 21 said, There are many plans in a man's heart. Nevertheless, the, Lord, the, the Lord's counsel, that will stand. J Joseph understood something. I'm going to make it through this because God's given me a vision. I can make it through this because God has made me indestructible. And let me tell you, he needed to be indestructible because the Bible says his brothers hated him. And can I tell you, it was not exaggerated. His brothers hated him, despised him, wanted to see him dead, and they schemed to make it happen. And if it wasn't for one brother, and we'll look at that next week, one brother, it would have taken place in our life. It gives us a sense of indestructibility. It gives us a sense that, that Lord, I don't know what, what's going on right now, but I know what's on the other side of this is what you've showed me. I know what's on the other side of this, Lord God. You've called me to a purpose that you didn't call me to, to fail in because you empowered it, you strengthened it, you've anointed it in, in, in our life. We need to understand, we need to understand stand that. In our, no matter what the forces that come against us is, we can stand with the confidence that I'm indestructible. There's few hatred that is as strong as common hatred. What is common hatred? When you hate somebody and somebody else hates somebody, that same person, that the third person hates somebody, and after a while, 11 brothers are lined up hating one person, and his name was, was, was Joseph. That was a danger for Joseph. Joseph couldn't die. But why? Because God had showed him that he had anointed him for a dream. God wouldn't allow it to happen. 
And when we have that kind of passion, that kind of dream in our life, we can embrace God. So for next week, let's finish the, let's finish the 37th chapter of Genesis. 37 uh, the verses 12 through 36 as we see how Joseph's, uh, how Joseph's brothers respond and in their hatred actually catapult David into God's plan. Catapult David. You know, let me tell you, even though it's this Satan looks like he's winning, he's losing. Even if it looks like your life is falling apart, if you're, if you're in pursuit of what God has for our life, your life is not falling apart. God is, is blessed. So God bless you. We appreciate you for coming out tonight. Appreciate you for uh, launching into Joseph with us. Uh, uh, come back be with us as we explore more of what Joseph has to teach us, what Joseph shows us in our lives.